is a machine learning engineer at a company called Monotel, where we focus on uh, essentially data management for machine learning purposes, so a lot of data annotations. And before that, I have uh, a couple of years of experience working as a machine learning consultant, mostly in the visual domain. And I was introduced to the topic of uh, interpreting complex models about a year ago by one of the organizers here for this meetup, uh, who talked about the difficulty of understanding how a model works. And that triggered my sort of interest to dig deeper into this area, and I essentially spent nights and weekends reading up on different papers and writing different notebooks and trying to get a feel for this. So I should preface with that I'm not an expert. This is more me sharing my journey of how I got introduced to this area and some of the learnings that I picked up. So that hopefully, if you see that this is something you might have used for in work or in academia, you can sort of use this as a stepping off point for your own research. So let's get started. And I want to start off with this image that popped up in uh, my LinkedIn feed eight months ago. And the question was pretty simple. What animal do you see? Now, yes, this is not a real naturalistic image. It has been manipulated. But the interesting aspect is that uh, let's see. most people, when they look at this image, they say that they see a cat, right? Uh, but then the question is, what does a state-of-the-art convolution neural network see that looks like this image? Uh, and if we then sort of think back to okay, how do comments work? What are we taught in school land reading papers? Well, we're taught that we have an input image, we put it into this complex architecture where we step by step break down the image into more and more abstract features. So we learn that in the first layers, we break it down into edges, then it gets broken down into basic shapes and then more complex features, and it uses that information to form a conclusion. So if we get back to this image, humans, most humans say that they see a cat. But if you ask the CNN, and this is a state of the line CNN, uh, state of the art CNN, it says it sees an elephant. And this is quite interesting because in this paper they revealed that this preconceived notion that we have, uh, which was how CNNs work by looking at shapes and edges, doesn't really match with how they work in practice. Because in practice, what most CNNs actually look at is the texture. They don't care about the sort of global shape of the object. And why this is fascinating for me is that it sort of proves that most of the time, we cannot explain how our model reaches a conclusion. Even though we might think that we have a pretty good understanding of how our model works. Because most of the time, we think about how we reason as humans, and we project that onto our models. And this can be to have quite dire consequences, because even though this was a toy example, about the scenarios where we train a model and then we try and predict how it's going to react or a lot of distribution sample, uh, we might have a completely wrong <coughs> And so, you know, the other question arises, why is it so hard to interpret our models? And if you read through papers, there is this sort of notion that's generally put forth that there is a trade-off in accuracy or capacity, as some people would call it, versus interpretability. Because if we think back to linear models, like basic linear regression, they are fairly easy to interpret. We have some features that we put in, and each feature gets a weight. We can look at that weight, and we can reason, OK, so how much importance do we attribute to this feature? When we look at nonlinear models, especially deep learning, looking at the, the weight in a neural network it doesn't tell you anything. Right? That number is just complete magic in a lot of ways. But you know, the trade-off is linear models, OK, we have methods, and we can look at them, and we can understand them. But the sort of capacity is limited. You're not going to uh, build a self-driving car using linear models only. It's going to be pretty challenging. And with deep, uh, deep convolutional neural networks and so forth, we have the capability of capturing incredibly complex interactions. But the drawback is that we really don't know what's happening sort of behind the scenes. It's the definition of a, of a black box. And I also want to state that it's important to remember that this is also attributed to sort of the, the data that we're dealing with. 
because a lot of the times when we're dealing with linear models, we're using features that make sense on their own. Right? So if we're, if we're using something for backbones or like estimating the price of houses, <coughs> which everyone does during the stats 101, you have square footage, you have uh, which floor the house is on, every single feature makes sense. But if you're looking at images, video, text, audio, each pixel doesn't make that much sense. It's part of reason about it. So it is connected to the data that we're using with these models. And so when I when I started reading this, you know, my background working in computer vision, I thought, well, well hold on. You know, when I've been training my models for the past three years, I had a great way of sort of checking if my model learned the right thing. And that was using saliency maps. And saliency maps is a really simple technique. You have your input image. <coughs> that you propagate through your convolutional neural network. Uh, that gets you know, a score, and then you pump that through a softmax to get all of those probabilities for the different classes you're interested in. And there's a really simple technique where you compute the gradients of each pixel in the input with respect to uh, like the score that you get, and then you get a weight. So you get a sort of signal of where is the network actually looking. And I would use this all the time. So if you, for example, look at the image down bottom, this was a dog animal classifier. And you can see that if you, for this image, compute the gradients via backdrop, you can see that, oh, it appears to be looking in the region where the dog is. And this must be the information that it's using to decide that it is, in fact, the dog. But there is a drawback with this, and it's stability issues. And there is a really interesting paper that was put forth a while back, where they showed that if uh, like one of the one of the basics for if you want to have a good measure of interpretability is that if the prediction changes of the network, the evidence should change as well. Right? And what they did was they showed that they, they had an image of a bird, they pumped it through a CNN, and they got similar activation maps that highlighted the features of the bird. And then they had another convolutional network where they gave the same image in but they had random weights, so complete noise. And they got a pretty similar image as well. And they did a lot of different tests. They flipped labels, they inverted the image. They could sort of do all kinds of different stuff to input data. And they would still get saliency maps that look reasonable, right? It's looking at the bird. Um, and so obviously this, this method doesn't really work. And I also think this is sort of indicative of Scenarios where we find ourselves as engineers. We have methods that we use to gauge how well our model works, and we trust them on blind faith. Because we read in some paper that we can use this thing. And then when you start reading up more on this, you see that there's a sort of brand new branch of the ways that you can go about actually getting useful interpretability metrics out. And it's called uh, additive feature. <coughs> attribution methods. And the idea is pretty lucrative. So the problem we have with complex models is that it's really, really hard to sort of disentangle them, look at the pieces and make sense of them. But the basic idea is that we create an explanation model G for our original model F. And this explanation model, it's a local model. So we design it to explain why the network, the model, predicts its output for a specific input. And if you look at the top right equation, all of these additive feature methods, they're linear. And as I mentioned before, when we work with linear models, we have tools in our toolbox that we can use to assess and see uh, why we get a certain prediction. And I'm going to go more into depth. So during this presentation, you will see some math. And I will try and break down that math so that it doesn't seem as intimidating. Because all of these ideas are pretty simple in a way, and they're pretty clever. And one of the core ideas to make this work, so using a linear model to explain your highly nonlinear complex model, is the concept of simplified inputs. So what are simplified inputs? If we take a look at this image of a cat, uh, the dimensions are 2850 by 1900 by 3, three color channels. So in total, if you would look at, like, if you would represent this as a matrix, how many elements would it have? Over 60 million features. This is what we input into our networks. Right? Even if 
we scale it down, a lot of numbers are being input in. And as I mentioned before, dealing with pixels doesn't tell us all that much. But if we look at uh, this image, we can see that a lot of these pixels are highly correlated with their neighbors. So we can cluster them together to form superpixels. The superpixels have been around for ages. But doing this, we can deconstruct this image into small image patches. And we can go from 60 million features to, in this case, 300 features. So 300 of these superpixels. And the neat idea about simplified inputs is that that mapping function, where we go from our highly complex 60 million feature image down to 300, since it's specific to the input, we can essentially form that function however we like. So it doesn't have to be an analytic function. This, this is good enough. So what we do is, uh, and also when we have these 300 features, we can represent it as a single vector with 300 elements, with a zero and a one representing if uh, that superpixel is present or not. So to get the basic idea, we've gone from 60 million features down to 300. And uh, what we're dealing with now is a vector of size 300 with only binary input size. And so that's, that's, the, that's the key ingredient behind uh, making this work, that it's for a specific input X. So if you want to do this for multiple inputs, you're going to have to essentially, in, like in the previous case, you're going to have to compute those superpixels again. Uh, then if we, if we move on, it, when you think about uh, having a model for interpretability, there are some sort of constraints that you want to have on that frame, some properties that we want to hold in order for it to make sense. And the first one is local accuracy. And this is fairly intuitive. If we're building a linear explanation model to approximate how a really complex model works, it's only going to make sense if, there, uh, if the approximation is good enough with the complex model. And again, we can sort of use this trick where we only focus on a single input to make that feasible. So, so this requirement makes sense, right? Approximation model should be good to our original model. And then another uh, thing that we would like to see is uh, missingness. So if a feature is absent, we don't expect it to impact the outcome of a model. So it should be attributed zero as a feature. So that also, intuitively, it makes sense. Finally, we expect consistency. And this looks far more intimidating than it actually is. So imagine that you have two models that are trained in different genes. And in one of these models, if we train it uh, with like 299 features, and we include the feature number 300 that we're focused on assessing how much does this impact this model. Uh, if, it, if the marginal gain of adding that feature to sort of better model is higher than the, the less good model, then we would expect that the weight attributed to that feature should be higher. In the right? So if we add the nose of the cat in one model and it increases the prediction of cat opposite to the other model, then we should expect that the weight associated with that feature for the good model should be higher than for the bad model. So now we've sort of laid the foundation of what's, what's really uh, sort of the core underpinnings of these AFA methods. But then the question is, how do we actually calculate these weights, right? So we know about simplified inputs, the increase in input space. We know about the constraints, the local accuracy, messiness, and consistency. And this is where sort of the fun part begins with how we actually get these values out. And like a lot of things in machine learning, uh, it's inspired by game theory. And uh, more specifically by shapely values. Because the, the thing about shapely values is that they fulfill all of these requirements. And they were constructed back in the 50s where some researchers were uh, exploring how should you divide a payout fairly in a group of uh, workers that all have different amounts of skill compared to each other. And when I first saw this equation, I, I, spent, I spent countless nights trying to <laughs> understand it, sort of break it down. Because for me, it looks fairly intimidating. 
And then I saw that you can actually rewrite this equation from the top form, which you usually see in papers and presentations, and most people always skim over this. They say, ah, it's from a paper in the 50s and it works, so let's go to the, the, the results. But if you rewrite it into the second form, you can actually start to make sense of it. Well, I'm having a lot of trouble with this. So. So to, to break it down and to make it more understandable, we're going to do a toy example. And in this toy example, we're going to envision that we have an image that we've divided up into four superpixels. And we are interested to see how each superpixel impacts the prediction of our model. In order to do that, we need to compute these weights. Right? So each weight is associated with each of these four different simple parameters or features in this image. And so, and so let's say that we are interested in seeing how superpixel A impacts the prediction. So we choose A to focus on. And then if we look at the set of all remaining features, we have B, C, and D. And if we look at that summation in the equation, it says that we're summing over all possible subsets of the subset N minus I, so our case B, C, and if we write this out, we can see that this subset S can be constructed in eight different ways. So we have the null subset, we have B and C and D, and then so forth. And so we want, what we want to do is we want to see how the output changes for each of these subsets if we add the feature A. And then that sort of scary number over there, or scary expression, becomes pretty simple to understand we divide with the number of sets we can form a size s. So what that means is we're interested to see how does A impact our output, like the prediction of our output. We're going to assess that by adding, comparing a model that's trained on all different subsets or features, which doesn't have A, and see if we add A, what happens then? How much is it increased? And so, uh, for example, if we uh, train a model only with B, then add A, we train a model only with C, and then add A. Then we train it only with D, and then add A. Then we're going to have we, have, we are we have trained a model three times with one feature, and then added A. So we divide it by three. So the marginal gain of adding A, and we divide it by the number of sets. And then, completely outward, we divide it with the number of features that we're totally dealing with. Are you following? So suddenly, if we look back at that sort of first equation at the top, if you break it down, it, it makes sense. It makes more sense, at least. Okay, so now we have a feel for the general framework of how this works. So each simple you <coughs> get a weight, we know how that weight is calculated. And we can use that weight to sort of reason how much of an impact does it do. How does this look in practice? Well, if you take cheap values in an ML setting, it straight over. Uh, you get that equation, and as before, you essentially have the marginal value of adding that new feature and comparing the output with the present one. But the problem is complexity and how it scales. So it scales horribly in this negative side. Uh, 2 by the power of m. And I think here, yeah, m is the number of features that you have in your set. And what's even worse is if you focus on the, where we compute the marginal gain of adding our feature i, it requires retraining for each subset of features. So if we have that picture with 300 simplified inputs, or 300 simplified features, that means that we're going to have to retrain it for all of these different permutations, right, if we want to assess a specific pixel. So that's cool. That's never going to work. But I would say that the, 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 I think in short, that said be complete is listed in the, uh, the classic book on uh, complexity, and be complete by the theory. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. It is complex. Yeah, so it's, it doesn't make sense in practice. But fortunately for us, a ton of research has been done in how we can go about making this visible in practice. And we come to the point where uh, some uh, people, Grim, Bag, and Lee, back in 2017, they uh, explained that they formed a unified approach to dealing with shaping values in different contexts. And their approximation, they call it SHAP. And the interesting thing about CHAP is that they show that uh, 
because over the years, different explanation models have popped up in a very ad hoc fashion, uh, like Lime and Lip, which some of you might have come across. And all of them, in the papers, if you read about it, they're all essentially based on, this, this works, but ah, we can't explain why. It just makes sense, it highlights regions of interest, and it works for text, and it works for this and that. But they showed that all of these different techniques that were discovered can be unified under, under the shape the value context, and you can do some approximations and simplifications to actually have it uh, useful in practice. And they released even a Python package that's called Shap, that you can download completely free of charge, where they include these different explainers. And these explainers are essentially for different types of machine learning models. If you're using tree models, or computer vision models, or NLP models, there's a different explainer that you can use to do this process, to produce these simplified inputs and to get these weights up. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through some different examples where they use these, uh, uh, these different libraries, the selection, to show you how it works in practice. So this is an example where they're using Chef for image classification with the kernel explainer. And so if you look at the, the Chef value, if it's green, uh, it contributes to the prediction. If it's red, it, no, it says that it pulls it up. And what's, what's uh, interesting about this is they go about it the same way. They form super pixels of the inputs. And here we have an image of an apple and a strawberry. And if we look at the strawberry prediction on this apple, and this the image of the apple and the strawberry, we can see that the, the region, like all of the strawberry is being used to form that conclusion that this must be a strawberry. There's a strawberry in this image. But if you look at the image of the apple, we can see that there are some regions on the apple that indicate a like, positive presence of strawberry as well. And so if we think back to the first example I showed you, where we uh, formed the conclusion that cognates care more about texture than shape, we get an indication of that already here. Because it's confusing the surface of the apple with the white dots and the red background with being a part of the strawberry. And if we look at the prediction for uh, Granny Smith, which is the type of apple, we can see that it attributes uh, some weights of some sort of importance to the super pixels belonging to the apple, but it's also triggered by that strawberry. Right? So that strawberry being used to form that. Okay, this, these features do not contribute to me saying that there is an apple in this picture. And then for fig, it doesn't care at all about anything. So to me, to me, this this is this is really interesting. Like when, when I did this and I played around with played around with notebooks, and I did my old trick that I used back as a consultant with saliency maps, and the entire image would light up like a Christmas tree. Uh, here's another example. So I didn't want my presentation only to focus on images because you know that's my background. So there are some examples where they use it on text, and I think in this case it's for sentiment analysis. So we use a model that was trained on reading reviews off of Rotten Tomatoes to predict the sentiment of if it was a positive reading, review or a negative review, review. And here you can see a breakdown of the different words that I looked at and how much they contribute to the conclusion that it's a positive review. Yeah. So you can use it for a lot of different things. So, okay, so we have Shap. Cool, problem solved. Have model interpretability. Let's uh, let's go build our autonomous cars and our <laughs> series and uh, Lexus and, and whatnot. But this is still an open problem. So when you look through research, you realize that they've just begun to scratch the surface. And if you think back to what I said previously, the trick we used was we used a linear model and we focused it on a single input, and that is local interpretability. So for each image that we have in our data set, we can get an understanding of how our state-of-the-art model predicts the class for it. But we can't really ask the model and tell it, you know, when, when you see cats, how do you see them? Like, we can't ask that general question. So we still don't have global interpretability. And this is really challenging because in a lot of settings, they, they explain that they, they train their model, they use SHAP, they use all of these tools, they throw in a whole bunch of images, 
and they think that, okay, well, this, this model should work. It should treat these other distribution samples in a good way, and it doesn't, right? So when they get feedback uh, back from how it works in practice, it turns out that it might have been a little bit horrible. Uh, so that's, it's important to remember sort of the trade-offs that we're doing in order to make this you know, feasible in practice in terms of computation sleep. And so why should we care about interpretability? And this is where the philosophical part of this, this talk for me appears into. And it's, a lot of people think that this is going to lead to the development of better model architectures. Because right now, when we're trying to think of new ways to train our models, we're pretty much looking for a needle in a haystack. We have some idea, we try it out, we try it on different data sets, and then if we find the result, we publish a paper and we say that, oh, we have a new novel activation function and it increases our score on ImageNet or CFAR or whatever. But if we get a better understanding of how our models work, we might actually use that to leverage it into building better architectures and better tricks that we can use to actually boost performance. And then this, this is the part that I'm uh, most, that I mostly care about given my current job working with the annotations. And that is that this could impact how we produce labeled training data. One of the big drawbacks with deep learning, one of the big strengths with deep learning is that, oh, if you have massive amounts of data, you just push it into your model and you get value. And that sounds super lucrative for companies that just aggregate and accumulate data, but that's really, really expensive. Annotating data, making it useful, takes a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And when you train your model, it's really hard to know, is my model not performing correctly on this data because of my choice of architecture, because of how I decided to uh, go about training, or is it because of the data that I'm training on, or more specifically the annotations? What is causing my model to not live up to its potential? And this could be very interesting because I, I am convinced that uh, getting better models won't work if we need to collect more and more data continuously. Right? So the idea that a lot of companies have where they just keep collecting more and more data and hoping to find a signal somewhere in that data to use the models, that's never going to scale. Because if we're actually going to get anywhere with all kinds of machine learning, we need to be smart about how we gather our data. And right now, it's a lot of guesswork and a lot of hunches. Uh, and the reason about how to collect that data. So this could be huge in this case, if we could actually ask our model to see how it goes about forming a conclusion. <coughs> and then finally, it's required for safety, safety and ethics. So I don't know if all of you know this, but back when they passed GDPR, there's a section in it that talks a lot about AI and how AI will function in society. And one of the requirements is the uh, explainability of AI. So if you apply for, let's say, a bank loan, and it, you get rejected, and the reason is that they're using some really complex AI system, it is your right as a European citizen to go to that company and say, I want you to explain to me in detail why I did not get that loan. What was used by that AI system to decide that I'm not suitable for a household? And if you then say, oh, well, you know, it performed great on our historical training data, that's the reason. That's not going to apply. So we're getting more and more, more and more people that don't necessarily work with AI are starting to form these rules on how you should conduct AI in practice. And since this is becoming a bigger, bigger part, being able to explain in a layman's way to people why a model behaves in a certain way is becoming more and more important. And that is why more and more energy is being spent on this area, trying to figure out how to go about model interpretability. And uh, I think that's about it. Uh, I'm open for questions now. If you have them. Or thoughts in general.
then it would be hard for us to feel that why <coughs> then I mean how do we get from you know, it, it's, it's not an easy question to answer, right? Because the, like, the concept of simplified inputs, a lot of this, it won't scale to that setting. Where I mean, ideally, if, if you look at a, a, a clerk that works at a bank and that decides on bank loans, if I don't get a bank loan, I can ask them, why did you decide that? And then they might say, well, given your, your uh, background, your history, and, and I don't know, if you have some remarks that you didn't pay bills 15 years ago, uh, and you might have a criminal record, then I decided that I don't think you're suitable for this. And that is something that, I mean, I don't know if we're ever, ever going to get there, but ideally, we would want to get some similar information out of our models in the future, mm -hmm. especially if they're being used to form these really critical decisions. We need something more than it was weighed on the test test. Yes, you had a question as well. Yeah, so do you see a distinction between <coughs> usually what I call more debugging of models on the left-hand side here versus explainability, which we have on the right-hand side. Because to me, explainability has much more stringent requirements on proofs and, yeah. and proving decision boundaries and all that stuff uh, as compared to, to yeah. debugging. So uh, when uh, when they uh, introduced the SHAP, the, the library, and they built it on these GP values, one of the core things that they mentioned is that it, it actually has a foundation in game theory and in mathematics where you can prove that this is a fair way to estimate how you attribute importance to different features. But I mean you're completely right because when you, when you look and read up on interpretability, most people uh, who care about this in a practical sense are engineers and you care about debugging. You want to make the models better, you want to understand why they don't work the way they should. Uh, and the people who are talking about it more towards the safety and ethics side, they speak more in abstract terms. It's really hard to pin down the sort of concrete way of performing explainability. And even if you think about the examples that I showed towards the end, I would argue that it's more towards the debugging side than actually explaining you know, the safety and ethical side. Because we're dealing with local models, right? We're not doing you don't have a global explanation model. So that that is a big challenge. And I should also state that a lot of people have the opinion that model interpretability is really important for machine learning as a community and in order to get more machine learning out into production and industry. But there is a group of people, engineers and um, researchers alike, that feel that this is being a bit over, so too much emphasis is being put on model interpretability, where they feel that if we have enough historical data and we have really good testing regimes, where we test our models continuously, we have a feedback loop to detect if the model is stale, or if it's doing mistakes, then that should be enough. And they usually point to the fact that we were not even getting close to global interpretability, we're just focusing on local interpretability, and we're fooling ourselves that we actually know what our model is doing, except for those examples that we feed into. Okay. Well, well, uh, like science in uh, understanding animal and human brains. Uh, obviously, not uh, I have not had time to uh, <laughs> dig into that area. <laughs> I, you know, I think you bring up a good point. It's, it's interesting, whenever you look at, I remember when I started doing machine learning and computer vision, and uh, you know, going through that sort of classical book there where it's patterns and image recognition, they say, that, oh, a convolutional neural network, the architecture is inspired by the brain, it's breaking down features layer by layer, blah, 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 blah. But then in the end, when you look at the optimizer, oh, it's optimizing the KL divergence a statistical measure between two distributions. I doubt that that's how my, my mind works, right, when I'm learning and trying to make a decision. So clearly there is a gap between how biological systems work and the foundations that we have in mathematics to explain them. Yeah, I think I read this as a challenge, but humans are very good at uh, looking at landscapes, faces, and so on, because they are really good at judging angles, yeah. and so on. And that's how I would find out that it was a cat. As I try to see the angles of everything. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, but the machine learning model is, does not do that. So then you need a model that could take like, think a little bit bigger. Yeah, because, yeah. The question is always how you go about constructing that model. Yeah. 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 So, like, the mathematical language that we have access to doesn't, it's, it's really hard to explain <coughs> a lot of things that we. 
probabilities and teams and, and mathematics. Yeah. And it's also interesting, like if, if we think back to the previous example, like here, why, why did we get like, saliency maps that trigger similarly independent of the weights that we put in? And a lot of it is that if you look at how a convolution network is constructed, the tricks that we use, convolutions in and of themselves is uh, a choice of how to represent abstractions of inputs. And, like, it's a way to represent how to extract knowledge from a certain input. If you think about it in terms of statistics, it's a prior. So all of the decisions that we make when we choose uh, optimizer, when we choose model architecture, number of layers, size of them, even in like uh, uh, tree models and everything, we're just throwing in more and more priors, like more and more ways that we affect how our model is going to train and do towards the end. And that's also affecting how these models operate and work and why they come to a specific conclusion. Any more questions or thoughts? I would recommend all of you to just throw a, a look at this field. Uh, I, feel, I feel like sometimes it, it's overshadowed by uh, cool stuff that happens with reinforcement learning and new, new benchmarks. But there are some really interesting things that are going on with the model interpretability. <laughs> and in my case, you know, working as an engineer, and I spend a lot of my day looking at annotations and images, which are a lot of models at my work, uh, just realizing that I can't trust these saliency maps and the knowing that I can use shaft and different methods to gauge, uh, to get a better gauge of how my model is working has, has helped me quite a lot. Just another comment. I mean, is this uh, kind of my impression has always been that interpretability like this is not necessarily black box models because it's, it could also be a uh, a very high dimensional decision tree as well, and it would be very hard to interpret whatever that decision tree came up with. Um, so I mean, it, I mean, the the word of choice here is in terms of black box models. Is that really fair, or is it more a problem of high dimensions and dimensionality reduction? Depends on your definition of a black box model. So I would say, like, even if you have a really big uh, decision tree, in some sense, it is a black box. Right, because if you follow down all of those notes, it also depends on the kind of input you're throwing into that model. It might be really hard to decide, well, how did it actually form this decision boundary here if you should go left or right. So yeah, black box is, I mean, it's, it's bigger than, than deep learning. Yes, I would say so. And there's a, as I said, like we, we, we have ways of analyzing and interpreting our linear models. But I added a star before when I mentioned it. Because this isn't easy, right? I mean, I, I think most of you have encountered like collinearity when you do linear regression and realize what a pain that is to understand like, oh, what is actually happening and is my model making sense? So, and this more relates back to what we talked about previously in that mathematics, using mathematics to explain something that we have in the real world and act upon it, it's a challenge because the transition between human speech and how we think as humans or into mathematics, it's quite challenging. for images, or, or suppose if you have a lot of quantitative data, is this okay? You mean if you can use these frameworks for, for other than images? Yeah. yeah, so the, the SHAP library that I listed, you can use it for text, you can use it also for more traditional linear regression models as well. So it's, it's, uh, you can use it for essentially all kinds of data, I think. I haven't seen, uh, I haven't seen audio, though. Which is interesting. And nobody, nobody even mentions audio, so I'm not sure about that. Okay, it feels like we're done. Uh, if you have any more thoughts or questions, you can just grab a hold of me and ask. I'll try and answer it as best as I can. And if I can, hopefully I can point you to a paper. <laughs>